Welcome to This Organized Life. If you're a mom, wife, or coffee lover seeking advice on how to reduce clutter and reclaim time, look no further than your host, Lori Palau, founder of Simply Be Organized and author of Hot Mess, A Practical Guide to Getting Organized. For a lot of people, clutter is their dirty little secret, but it doesn't have to be. Each week, we will share practical tips, chat with experts, and provide strategies on how to keep you organized. I hope that by sharing our stories, you feel a little less alone and more empowered to tackle the areas that are holding you back. So let's get started. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of This Organized Life Podcast. I am your host, Lori Palau. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to thank you guys. Um, we've been getting lots of feedback that we've got some new listeners. Um, so if this is, you know, you're newer to our show, welcome. Make sure you check out our back catalog because we've got like well over 300 episodes on a plethora of topics. And so you could definitely, um, if there's something that you want to learn about or hear about, uh, we may have it. And if not, shoot us a message, like DM us or send us an email, whatever you want, all our contact information's in our show notes, um, because we love hearing from you guys. And if this is your first time tuning in, make sure you click that subscribe button. Um, new episodes get downloaded each week. We drop every single week. Um, we're actually crazy in our seventh season or seventh year, which is like insane to think about. Um, but we, we, again, we love doing this for you. And so if you like our show, just, we really appreciate any kind words, ratings, reviews, things that you want to, you know, sharing it with friends, all great ways to help keep our show current and alive. So thank you so much. Um, but now I want to get into today's guest. So this is a conversation that I've wanted to have for a while now and schedulings and whatnot have not aligned, but here we finally are. So joining me today is Kelly Brask and Kelly was referred to me through one of our SBO partners because she specializes in a technique of decluttering called the Swedish death cleaning. And I don't really know a ton about it myself, um, but that's why I br brought her on. Um, because again, it's, uh, it's a specific approach and technique that she's going to walk us through to help people really be intentional about the stuff that they're holding on to, why they're holding on to it. Um, again, we talk a lot here about emotional clutter and why we hold on to the things, whether it's through guilt, whether it's through fear, whether it's through sentimental purposes. And I'm curious to learn from Kelly how they incorporate or what steps and tools they use and the mindset that plays into helping people make decisions to get rid of the physical items, because we all know that emotional clutter winds up resulting in the physical clutter. And so if that's something that you struggle with, I think this is going to be a really um, helpful episode. And certainly I know I'm going to learn a lot. So I'm really excited to bring my guest out. Help me welcome Kelly Brask to the show. Good morning. How are you? Good, thank you. So I gave our listeners a real kind of top line, just letting them know what you do, but without a lot of detail, because again, I'm going to be learning from you on <laughs> what your methodology is or how you even came about learning about this and why you decided to kind of incorporate that into your business model as a professional organizer. So why don't I just let you take control of the mic and share a little bit about you and your backstory? Sure. Um, I'm doing it in English, right? Not Swedish. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Although we do have listeners in Sweden, so we do have- Oh, exciting. Okay. So I'm Kelly Brask. I'm a certified professional organizer and I live in Chicago. Um, so I'm a member of NAPO, along with you, member of NAPO Chicago. And I also serve as director of communications for the BCPO, which is the certifying board of certified professional organizers. Um, I am- I don't quarter half-ish Swedish via my ancestry and moved there. Well, first I spent a summer there when I was um, a teenager and it was 
gorgeous. Like the sun never set and we could bike to the castle where the king and queen lived. And it was just, it was just lovely. So I spent a year of college there and then moved back after college for like for a year, I thought, it, which ended up being over 20 years. And during that time, I had a few different jobs. I met my husband. I had my daughters. I um, had three year-long maternity leaves, which was lovely. And about 10 years ago, we all moved to Chicago. And during that time in Sweden, um, I would come back and visit my family in the States. And I hadn't originally planned to be gone that long. So I just taken like all my stuff and put it in storage at friends and relatives. And each time I, time I came on vacation, I would, you know, it's go through my stuff. That was like a hobby for me and gave me a sense of knowing what I had and still being able to keep a foot in, in America and potentially move back like that um so just going through my stuff was something that I felt gave me a sense of peace and control and then years later you know I'd seen Peter Walsh on the Oprah show but I didn't understand that organizing was an industry and I heard another organizer being interviewed um because we were streaming a Chicago radio station and I was like what it's like this is what I want to do when I grow up it's just, you know <laughs> it's in my um it's in my bones it's something I love to do so I joined NAPO right away and started educating myself and I've been doing it over 10 years now that's really interesting I love it yeah there's so many people um especially people that have been you know started back a decade ago plus right where you know where you didn't have instagram you didn't have pinterest there weren't all of these <laughs> no. places and people were like wait you can you can make a living doing this i feel like nowadays it's more mainstream because people see it on social media and it's talked about and you have to, you know marie kondo and the home edit and things talk about it. but back a decade ago i know when i started my business in 2009 people were like wait what you're you know, what exactly do you do? <laughs> exactly. And you spent a lot of, I spent a lot of time explaining what I do for people. Um, and also where, what you don't do. Exactly. Exactly. Right, because of media. Um, for, for sure. Right. But um, in our mutual friend always points out that like, I'm a process organizer. I am a deep thinker. I um, think very holistically and want everything to flow together. So, I recognize that you're not always going to have the exact number of toys or books in a different color so that they can line up nicely. Yeah. And while, while labels are functional, um, they're not always going to be beautiful. Like I, I focus more on the process and the functionality and the whole thinking through what's going to work and what's going to be work for you individually. So tying that into Swedish death cleaning, um, I was intrigued when I first heard the, started hearing the term on social media about, about five years ago now and learned that it was a book. And the original name is De Stadning Ingen Sorlig Historia, which has been translated to Swedish death cleaning. And the original title also has that tagline that it's, it's not sad, it's not morbid. So I read it several times in Swedish and English and realized that it was a similar approach to the downsizing part of organizing that I was doing. And I recognize the kind of the Swedish mindset, how that comes into play because they're very socially responsible. They aren't a, um, a people of extremes. There's this mm -hmm. whole concept of lagom where you, it's like kind of a Goldilocks, like not too much, not too little, but you have enough. Um, and so a lot of my clients knew that I'd lived in Sweden mm -hmm. and they started asking, you know, what is this about? And is this something, this is a different approach we could take because, you know, I had to clean out my parents' house and it was awful. And I don't want to do that to my kids. Mm -hmm. So thus began that, that niche and branch that I started working with. That's so interesting. And so maybe can you just walk us through what is like, how do you approach it? What do you, cause I know you said it's similar to like going through the downsizing, but just kind of getting into the tactics of what is, what is really entailed in going through, through, if you are going to use this methodology. 
Sure. Well, you know, in, in organizing, we have our, our space acronym where, you know, you sort and you purge. Mm -hmm. And that might mean that, oh, I don't need five hairbrushes or I'm, you know, I'm done with this painting hobby or whatever. And it's, it's more like the decluttering and the downsizing, whereas Swedish death cleaning is a lot more cerebral. It's and it's a lot more um, in the heart because you're kind of taking an assessment of what do I have in my home that's still serving me in life and what do I want with me at the end? And it doesn't mean that you have to be old or sick or dying to start it, but it's really being intentional about what you allow to remain in your home and in your life. Um, if you think ahead like beyond your time on this mm -hmm. earth um i know we all have wills mm -hmm. but well, they, hopefully we all hopefully, hopefully we all have we wills. all have wills yes but, we've talked we've done episodes on that yes yes you have um but a will bequeaths an estate mm -hmm. to a person or persons and isn't necessarily specific about all the little things so making those decisions earlier and letting people, you know, family or charities enjoy the things that you're done with instead of leaving it all to the end. Um, there, there's a lot of personal empowerment in that and, and peace in knowing that you've made the right decision and pass things along and, with less, with fewer things in your home, like there's less to clean, there's less to maintain. And no one wants to spend their retirement years maintaining everything they've accumulated during their first several decades, right? Absolutely. Now, I, can, I inter, can I interject with a couple questions? Absolutely. As we're going? Okay, so the first thing that popped into my mind as you were explaining this is like, that's a tall order. Right. So like, that's like, you're asking, Oh, it's not an afternoon. No. Right. Well, and, and that's the thing is it, this is like very, and I could see, you know, overwhelm and indecision. You know, we talk a lot mm -hmm. about what I call the five clutter pitfalls and two of them are that indecision of, I don't know what to do. So I'm kind of not going to do anything. Um, and then also the fear, the fear of making a mistake as well as just mm -hmm. the overwhelm of whether it's that decision fatigue or the stuff. And so when you were talking, all I kept thinking to myself is, oh my gosh, I'm being asked to make like a permanent decision about something that theoretically might not happen for decades, which kind of leads me to a next comment slash question is, <laughs> is this something that you recommend for people. At, and again, we, we, none of us know when our time is up and whatnot, but is this something that you recommend people that are, should adopt as they're, as they're like aging or somebody that's a mom in her thirties with little kids is doing this? Cause I think she's just trying to think about like, how can I not step on Legos? <laughs> know. You know, so I guess how I can have I keep my like, family fed. Yeah, exactly. And I just want to sleep through the night. So it's, you know, I'm wondering, is there a specific time of life that you recommend adopting this? Um, that is a very good question. And I would say not necessarily. There's and and Margaret Magnuson, the author of the book, writes that, you know, there's it's never too too late to start until it is dun, dun, dun. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh but no it's, you know, but it's, it's also never too early to start developing a mindset of of log home or of what is serving me mm -hmm. and what it, what do I want to be part of my legacy what what should I be allowing to bring into my home or to come into my home um and so one question that I'll often pose is when someone's on the fence about something and often like you said it's because of guilt or because it was it represents a memory or or you know, a, a former relationship um is you know on your deathbed is it important that this is still in your room and if the answer is no then that means at some point between today and then 
whenever that is, it, it needs to leave. Mm -hmm. And is that going to be today or in a year or at some point? Because if you want it out of your life before your family has to take over, then, you know, plant a seed and start thinking about letting go of something. Yeah, it's it's definitely a very heavy approach, right? It is. And it's like I said, it's not light. It's not quick. Um, my clients who sign on to death cleaning commit to at least six months. Oh, and, okay. And we work together monthly. And a lot of it is setting a plan for, hmm. well, first of all, one of the first rules of, of Fight Club or death cleaning is, is you do talk about death cleaning. Okay. You are, you should absolutely tell your friends and family what you're doing. Um, it might intrigue them, but it, it also might give you opportunities to pass things to someone who will love them. If you're on the fence, like you said about, uh, do I really need to keep this? Is this still, um, something I want in my home? Right. Right. So some of the initial first parts of the process are thinking, you know, who all is involved either, you know, by sitting and hearing memories and as I go through this or by receiving things that I want to get rid of, that I want to pass along. Gotcha. So do you find that you have a specific type of demographic, maybe age, or is there certain people that are more, a better fit? for it again like you said you could do it at any right. point but I I'm would just say curious. most yeah most people are are intrigued um but mostly it's been the 60 70 year old women um one who is widowed and a couple who had been through this with their parents mm -hmm. that realized that they don't want to spend their next x number of years um you know having to take care of all the stuff that that was bequeathed to them or that they had accumulated and that they want to make it simpler than their parents had, for example. Sure. And I think, yeah, a lot of people say that once they've cleaned out someone's estate, they, they feel inspired to go home and purge because it's, it's heavy to do that for someone and Absolutely. doing it for someone you love. It is. It's a lot. And I, we, you know, I've had conversations with clients and I've had just conversations with friends that are like, I don't want to do like, I don't want to do this to my kids. You know, right. I don't want my kids to have to go through this. Um, and, and I can, I can certainly appreciate that. Another question that I thought of is when you're working with clients, do you work with them primarily one-on-one -on -one, or do you get like the, do you get couples to work together? Or again, if you're, if you're, core demographic are people that are maybe in their 60s they probably don't have you know kids at home or whatnot but is it something that you're just working one-on-one -on -one, or do you feel like this is something where you know we've built a life together some of these things are kind of joint family things that we need to incorporate other people into this decision making process um absolutely if it's a couple then it's good if they're both involved. Um, sometimes, you know, one part of the couple will kind of relinquish the control. It's like, you decide, I don't care. I have sure. better things to do with my time, which is a shame. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I agree, it's good to, to be on the same page there. Um, not necessarily beyond that, though. The children, the the cousins the nieces the nephews like anyone who who might be benefiting from things that are given away mm -hmm. um are more than welcome to discuss with their parents or with the person with my client but the more cooks you have involved and the more opinions sitting in a room that gets more difficult and ultimately you know what's mine is up to me what i want to do with and i'm you know i will welcome your input but like, like, for example, I, I have three daughters. Someday I'm going to have to figure out who gets which piece of, of jewelry or family heirloom. Um, and I want to be as even as possible, but ultimately I get to make that decision, right? Right, right. So I'm curious with stuff like that as you're going through it. And, you know, like I said, we've done episodes on estate planning and wills and having mm -hmm. kind of all of those, you know, pieces of the puzzle together. 
Do you, as part of your process, when you're working with people, do you formalize that? Like if somebody's going through it and they're like, you know, this was, and I'm just going to make up an example. This was my grandmother's China, or this was, you know, my mother's China. And I want to pass it along to my daughter-in-law or my daughter, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Is this, does, is there a next step to formalize that? Um, either by them telling them, by them write, you know, writing it down, putting it somewhere, or is it like, how do we take that next step? There's a couple different methods. There's like high tech and low tech. A lot of that depends on where people live. So for the family that that all lives nearby, you know, they can maybe come over with different colored post-it notes and just walk around and stick it on anything that they would like. And they might get it the next day. They might get it in the will um right right but that's a way to just kind of gauge interest and you really need to say that like give them freedom to be honest about what they want and what they don't want and and not not say like oh you know there's underlying motives for me asking this you know (laughs) well I can also imagine that again something might be of value to you but your Mm -hmm. child you may be like I want to give this I want to leave that my China to, or this piece of furniture or whatever to my fill in the blank. And that person doesn't really want it, you know? And I think that's something that we've talked about also on shows is what is the responsibility of the recipient to graciously accept that gift, but not feel compelled to hold on to it. Or do they Uh say, you know what? I really appreciate that, but I would rather it be like, have you had that type of a situation? Um, there has been a lot of realization from clients that China sets, for example, or even, you know, the, the crystal or the silver that they saved up to get the complete set that there's just no interest in that now. The the generation, you know, even, even Gen X, my generation, we're not hosting those types of parties and we don't necessarily have the memories associated with that set that our parents or grandparents did who, who used it more often. So there, that's a process of realizing that something that meant a lot Mm -hmm. might not still mean as much to me whom it did mean something to, and won't mean anything to people I would like to give it to because you can't impose your values or memories on someone else. No, of course. And I, um, so I listened to uh, the Dr. John Deloney show, shout out Dr. John, Dr. John. (laughs) Um, And one of the things that he talks about is, you know, we all, we all have images and we think in pictures, right. Of what this something's going to be, you know, passing and it could apply to anything, you know, but it's like, oh, I'm going to pass this down or my one day, my daughter's going to wear my wedding dress or, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever that it looks like. And more often than not, it doesn't play out the way we thought it would, or that we hoped it would, or that we envisioned things would. And I think that's really a, a common theme that I see when it comes to people, especially in in the kind of that boomer generation that was right. holding onto things that got passed down, things were passed down generationally. And then there was a shift and now people live, you know, more minimalistically in some ways, but they also, ha- they're just as happy going to home goods and buying some stuff that they can cycle <laughs> in and out and mix it up as opposed to saying, I'm just going to hold on to this. And so is part of the process with the Swedish Swedish death cleaning. Is it mourning that or working through that? Because I can imagine that might bottleneck somebody and go also, if they're like, I want to give this to so-and-so and and -and so-and-so doesn't want it. I could see an emotional roadblock go up and go, well, then I'll just hold on to it because I don't want it to end up. Yes. And and that's where, before someone signs on to this, we have a long conversation about expectations. And I need to know that they are 100% committed to the process because it's more than just regular decluttering. It's a lot of thinking about, you know, my goal is to have a simpler 
X number of years that are left in my life, but also to have like no excess at the end and to unburden my family. So there's a lot of forward thinking and that's heavy. It's a, it's a bigger, like, that's your why, right? We talk about why people do right. things, right? And so it would seem to me if your why in this case is, I don't want to burden my family with this. I want to have as few items, whatever the reason is, like that has to kind right. of align, and a lot of times we keep things because we think, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to look at this again, or I'm going to reread these letters, or I'm going to, you know, this will remind me of something. And then we put it in a box in the back of the closet or the basement for decades. And that's not, that's not even honoring the pers- purpose that you'd initially saved it for. So like, if you have saved you know, if you've called through your old letters, because we had this period in life before electronic <laughs> mail where people wrote handwritten letters. Um, and, and I still have some old ones and I've called through them over the years and something that was just signed, you know, even if it was a pretty card, it, it went. But I have a few letters that, you know, really express, express the essence of you know, my relationship with a grandparent or, or a childhood friend that mean a lot and I'm happy to bring them out on occasion and read them and show them to my family too. Um, And if you're not looking through that box of heirlooms or keepsakes or souvenirs and it's not on display, then why are you keeping it? Mm -hmm. And you can say that you're keeping it Oh, because I might want to look at it again someday. Well, Swedish death cleaning is the day or the days when you can look through it again. It's a a great opportunity to reminisce and then um, let go. I like that. So it's um, how long I'm curious also just as a professional organizer, because this is so heavy and there is a lot of decisions that need to be made and the process I'm sure is, is different than a traditional and I'm air quoting. Right. Which, which I, I do session. as well. What do you limit? Like how long a session is like how long if someone's embarking on this journey with you and they're committing to doing this, are you working? Like I, I would imagine after a couple hours, like people need to take a, take a break. Do you find that there's like a kind of a wall where people hit where it's like, okay, we've done enough for today. Let's put a pin um, in it. That's a good question. Not necessarily. I usually schedule sessions for four hours. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you're, that's... and you find that your clients can like hang and making those heavy decisions for four hours. Yeah. Cause it's not four hours of heavy decision after heavy discussion decision. It, it's okay. a lot of, of, um, stories and sorting and and discussion to help them ease into being more comfortable. I like that. I like that a lot. Um so I think maybe can you share like a couple of stories some from people maybe something that you've experienced just to kind of like just allow our listeners to have a kind of a a front row seat to like some situations that may have you've experienced through working with people over the years doing this type of, of, um, decluttering. Um, sure. So I have to be careful because I, I can't, well, can't we're not going to name, we're any. not going to, no, no, we're no. not going to name any names. We're not to break in any HIPAA laws. We just want to talk about just some, you know, Maybe um, some some things that people maybe learned about themselves or found that they thought were would be easier or harder to get rid of that it wasn't, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm- right. Um, so I think of a couple older women I've worked with and one, she was really funny. And I think I have this quote on my website. She's like, you know, I'm in my seventies. I have one son. And when I die, which, which I hope isn't before we're done with this, you know, I don't <laughs> think he's going to want to read every birthday card I've ever gotten and she had them all filed so nicely you know by year and by occasion she's like you know I liked to organize um but I don't need any of them you know Mm -hmm. they they were fun I don't love the people less because I'm getting rid of and I know my son won't care a bit and I don't want him to feel like he has to read through all of them yeah Uh, and and it, it is true I I see that I remember thinking back, my mom passed away years ago and my mom was a saver and (laughs) she, but not on the outside, 
you couldn't, you didn't say anything, but you opened up the drawer and she had a bunch of yeah. stuff. Um, and so she had saved like all of my kids, like birthday invitations were <laughs> thank you notes for a present that they got, you know, like things that, and it was very sweet, but I had no use for that, you know, and, and right. like, she was just saving it for her. And so when it came time for us to go through and make decisions about the stuff, cause she was no longer here. Like Almost like a time capsule. Yeah. And I mean, and it was, you know, but I was like, oh my gosh, she held on to all of these things. And it was, you know, I, I didn't hold on to them because I actually had kept in my kids' baby books, like, oh, here's your yeah. first, here is, here's from your first birthday invitation. You know what I mean? So like, I yeah. had stuff. but you know, it was important to her, obviously she lived for her grandkids. And so it was nice. But, you know, I remember distinctly sitting in her bedroom in this one drawer that she had. And she, I was just going through like all of these just, you know, random kind of generic things that she had held on to. Yeah, it's, it's, it gives you an interesting insight into maybe things you didn't know about, about the deceased person when you have to clean out their home. Yeah. Yeah, right. for sure. But you asked about specifics. Like I've had um, a client recently whose like parents or grandparents or in-laws had like escaped Europe during the war and had some really special items um, and she found a museum to donate them to. Oh, I love so that. That means, yeah, they're, they're going to be shown to people who are interested in the, the human aspect of that history. And, and, and her kids don't, you know, had no interest and, and yet she knew they were too special to go to just a general donation and or certainly to put in the trash. So sure. Sure. Oh, I love that. That's so, that's so great. What, is there anything else that you want people to know about this? Or maybe they're going, oh my gosh, this might be something that my parents <laughs> would be interested in because they yes. need to downsize. And, you know, maybe we've got some of this out there. God, we started to talk about this earlier with the post-it notes. I said, that's the very low tech version. Oh, oh yeah. We were talking about Airtable earlier. That's kind of like a higher tech and that's a, a database that I love and use all the time um, and allows you to share photos and have people you know, anywhere view them via a link and rank them or check on what they'd like or make comments. And that's a one way to gather information or data from everyone involved oh. and compare it. So, so essentially you would like take a picture of like, okay, here's grandma's yep. whatever, who wants the candy dish and you exactly. can exactly exactly. And then just send out like one, one survey or link where they can view everything. Can they, can Do you picture. set that up for your clients? Because I would imagine a lot of your clients are not tech savvy. I have set that up for, for a client. Well, but the kids are tech savvy. Yes. And, and even if they're not, they can click on a link and then they can check boxes. So, But yeah, I think corralling that stuff, especially when people are living all over, like you said earlier, you know, a lot of times you don't <laughs> have the family in the same town or the same city and getting the logistics of how do I even get this to you is another thing. That right. Sure but now, factor. now with all the holidays coming up, like even my, all my regular clients are like, okay, remember this thing we set aside the first time we worked together, you know, they're coming, they're, they're driving out from whatever state for Thanksgiving, they're staying for a week and I'm going to put this in their car and send it home with them. Oh my gosh. I love it. I love <laughs> it. That's great. Um, so if people want to learn more about you or mm -hmm. learn more about the process methodology where can they go what's the best place for them to connect up with you and well i'm on linkedin um okay. kelly brask and i have a facebook business page which is mm -hmm. just kelly brask certified professional organizer and my website is kellybrask.com and i have an entire section there on the swedish death cleaning Great, great. All right. Well, we are going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're just going to do our wrap up questions. So sit sure. tight. 
All right, Kelly, this has been, I don't want to say, I mean, it's been fun chatting with you, even though it's a really heavy topic, but I <laughs> That's can why say, you ease into it. Exactly. But I really think the why behind it is so important because you hear mm-hmm. this name and anything that has the word death in it, immediately, I think people are like, wait, what? But what? anything that has the word Swedish sounds kind of sexy, right? There you go. There you <laughs> go. So I, I really, I'm, I'm grateful that you kind of unpacked the process and we do so much here talking about the why of clutter and the why we do things. I love that ultimately, ultimately it comes back to what do I want my legacy to be? What do I want? What do I want to have that be? And we talked about that. I'm actually meant to mention this earlier and um, we'll link up to this in the show notes as well. We had a, a show last year with my friend, Matt Paxton, um, oh, about creating okay. a legacy list. And it's just, you know, it's just so, so much of it aligns just kind of like, what do I want to be remembered by? Why am I really holding on to this? And I think for so many people out there, when you're just in the weeds with life, especially when you have younger kids, you're not thinking <laughs> about that, right? You're just thinking about survival and the next carpool or the next, whatever it is. And, mm. um, but when you get to like the next season, you know, so maybe you're not in that season, but when you get to the next season, it is time to put a little bit more thought into, okay, here's what we've accumulated. Mm-hmm. What do we, do we still need this? Is it still serving us? And I exactly. love that. Exactly. I love that. Okay. So we always ask our guests a few questions. Um, mm-hmm. So first of all, we ask our guests in this season of your life, where do you feel the most organized and where do you feel like a little bit of a hot mess? Oh, okay. Um, I would say my papers are organized best. Oh. I'm kind of a filing and paper nerd. And um, I have a, a pink filing cabinet that I got for, for Christmas when I was a teenager and I still have it and use it. Um, so that's, I've always enjoyed. Um paper and and probably like data like I know things I remember dates I remember details and and I I put everything in air tables so if you want to know you know what it costs to get a cast changed at the doctor (laughs) is when my daughter fractured her arm like I can look that up easily oh you really are a data person (laughs) yes I (laughs) I like data um um data data like Christmas ornaments we um my husband and I decided when we got married um, 18 years ago that we would get an ornament each year that kind of signified the year. And so whenever we decorate our tree, I like bring them out and tell the stories. And my we have three daughters who, and they're sometimes they're interested, sometimes not so much, but that I put all into a list and air table so that we can keep track. Cause sometimes we're like, what year did we get the snowflake? <laughs> oh <laughs> but now gosh. we've got track of it all. Anyway. So, so that's areas where I am organized. Um, hot mess. Um, I would say family members who aren't quite on board with the putting things away (laughs) because I need to respect their um their decisions to um have agency over their own areas until it gets to a certain point it's very politically correct (laughs) of you to say it is very politically correct of you to say um and then the other question that I love to ask people, and we've actually started compiling a list, if anybody knows, Ooh. we just did a list um, that we put out from all of our guests' recommendations is, I don't know if you're a reader or not, but, um, and I'm going to, obviously, the book on Swedish death, death cleaning was yes. transformational for you. <laughs> um, in addition to that, which of course, we'll link up to that book, were there any other books that you either have read that have been very impactful or ones that you recommend to other people or that you go back to and kind of reflect upon? Um, I love anything by Malcolm Gladwell. I just love how he gets into like the story behind the trend. I think he's Mm -hmm. fascinating. And then Charles Duhigg, who wrote The Power of Habit, and I think it's Smarter, Faster, Better. Those are two books that I happily bought both the paper and the digital so that I could read and reread them whenever. And there's so much, yes, this makes sense. This is how we should be approaching this collaboration or this process. It's fascinating reading. 
Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. And we always, again, I selfishly ask this question because I love to get ideas <laughs> as well. And I know our listeners have really come to, to appreciate it well. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Kelly, I appreciate it. Get. Is that what, what does that say? Thank you. Yes. Or what does that Tox- mean? Toximic get. That's thank you very much. I love it. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, again, If this is your first time tuning in, thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to click the subscribe button, like, share, follow, all of the things. Um, We're here each and every week. And so until next week, I'm Lori Palau. Peace out. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, please spread the love and share it with your friends. And if this is your first time joining us, make sure to click the subscribe button wherever you're listening so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, please leave us a review so other people know that our show is worth the listen. You can also find us on YouTube and Instagram at This Organized Life Podcast. And if you'd like to connect with us, you can head on over to our website at simply the letter B, like boy, organized.com, which is filled with tons of resources, including free downloads, checklists, links to our amazing organizing partners, and all of our digital offerings. I'll see you next week for another episode of This Organized Life.